In normal fashion, I'll start with the plug, if you allow me to abuse this. So I'll come down. So the plug is open for debate, uh, which is a blog I guest headed, which is part of a project I run called Changing Attitudes in Public Discourse. We post every two weeks, every other Monday. The next post is this Monday. And uh, it's mostly philosophers, but also psychologists, social scientists. And the idea is we post stuff on anything that has anything to do with public debate. So there is, for instance, a really interesting post on why somebody is, is an atheist and committed so and can um, sort of say, I'm wholeheartedly an atheist. I don't need to say, oh, I'm an agnostic. Right? Uh, so that's one example. There's stuff on politics, on humility, all sorts of things. So I invite you to go and look at it. It's called Open for Debate. So after this, let me talk about today's talk. So here is my plan. What I'm interested in is anger. Now, I should start by saying, unfortunately, Italians mispronounce vowels. And so <laughs> it's really unfortunate I've chosen a topic that uses a word I can't pronounce properly. So if sometime I seem to be talking about being hungry, it's my Italian accent. What I'm talking about really is anger, the emotion, OK? So the topic is anger. And perhaps, again, I play to the stereotype, which is we Italians are very passionate people. And when I came to the UK, it really was surprising to me uh, that passion was always an indication of, you know, being hot-headed and irrational. Whilst in Italy, sometimes, is an indication of being committed, being serious, you know, being somebody who really cares, right? And so I've always had a soft spot for anger, right? And so part of what I'm trying to do today is argue or pro provide some arguments of why anger sometimes is really bad, but sometimes is useful in so many ways. And it's something that we should take seriously and respect. Right. So perhaps I don't need to sell this to you, but it does seem to be quite topical at the moment, right? Anger. Um, we... Uh, we hear all sorts of claims being made that uh, British politics has become really polarised and really bad-tempered. Uh, there was even a, a debate on anger in the moral days, which suggests that is really, really topical. The moral days, I like to call it the moral days. <laughs> so... And it's topical because Britain seems to have become more polarised than it was a while ago, and people seem to engage with each other in a much more angry way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to start right off by saying that I am really sceptical about calls for civility. So one of the things you hear after people say British politic, uh, politics has become more polarised, more angry, you then hear that what we need is a bit more civility, right? Um, and I want to convince you that I'm not, right, I'm not in favour of being rude and uncivil, right, and abusive and violent. Uh, but I am a bit suspicious of what calls for civility really do in this course. So I'd like to convince you a little bit that perhaps we ought to be careful about engaging in calls for civility. Then I want to start talking about the main topic, which is what is anger? And I'm going to distinguish, I'm going to talk about anger in itself, and then I'm going to distinguish a special kind subset of anger, which I'll call status anger. Because I think status anger is a typical expression of arrogance. And I'm going to say a little bit more about what I mean by arrogance in this context and why certain kind of status anger is a typical expression 
of arrogance, uh, and how that leads in debate uh, to disrespectful behaviours, uh, which are especially behaviours that are of intimidation and humiliation. And I'm going to say a little bit about how I think status anger, and especially arrogant anger, causes these behaviours. Uh, but then I want to say, okay, so that's the, the dark face of anger, if you want. But there is another aspect to anger. Anger can do good things for us. And there is, and there is a long tradition of writing about the power and the importance of anger. And that, at least as far as I know, is especially prominent in the Afro-American tradition during the period of the civil and um, preceding civil rights. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about why people working for black rights uh, and also feminists have written about anger as being a virtue, as being something that is important, something that is useful, something that is valuable, something that we should not suppress. And I'm going to highlight for you what I think are three distinct ways in which anger is useful for people who are fighting against oppression. The first use of anger is motivation, is an energy, is the engine, is what keeps you going in the face of difficulty. The second, anger is a source of knowledge, I'll try to argue. It allows you to understand things that you otherwise wouldn't understand. And although I'll repeat myself, just to give you a sense of why this is initially plausible. Has it ever happened to you that you are in a situation and then you feel angry and you don't know why, right? But you feel first maybe uncomfortable and then you feel a little bit like upset or angry, right? That anger that you don't know why has come up is like an alarm bell, right? There must be something going on here. And that alarm bell, now it could be a false alarm, of course, but if it isn't a false alarm, it's an insight. Why? Because it says, OK, so something is off here. And it allows you to stop and reflect and perhaps discover what's off. And so anger can be a source of knowledge. And I also want to say that anger is a form of moral address, is a way of calling other people to books. And, and I think this is also extremely important. I'll try to explain in some detail how I think that works. And if it's right that anger is important and valuable in these ways, then there is perhaps something wrong with trying to suppress expressions of anger. And what I'm interested in are attempts to silence anger, give you an example. Um, there's a title of, uh, I'll give you another plug then, there's a title of a paper I've written called Calm Down, Dear, right? That is an attempt to sort of say, don't be hysterical, right? What you say makes no sense, right? That is a way of silencing anger by transforming what is meant to be a moral address into mere venting, into just sort of, you know, being irrational, right? So that's what I mean about silencing anger and why I think that's bad. Suppressing anger, which is also bad, is when people have told you enough time to calm down, dear, you calm down. You stop expressing anger, and that is when you suppress anger, right? And that is damaging if anger is a source of insight. But I'll come back to that as well. And then I'm going to have a tiny modest proposal uh, on how to address um, the vitriol in our public debate. It is a modest proposal because its efficacy is modest. The real answer, if I'm right, about the causes of real anger, the real answer is a better society where people have less cause to be angry, right? That would be a much more successful proposal. But in the absence of that, we need to find ways of listening to each other. 
and listening to each other in a way that does not force people who have a rightful cause to be angry to suppress their anger. And so what I'm trying to suggest is a modest proposal that might help all of us to be angry in a better way and when others are angry with us, to be able to listen to them. So that's the plan and hopefully I'll be able to cover it. Julian here is going to keep me on time because sometimes I have a tendency to sort of go down rabbit holes. Let's hope I don't do that. Right, so maybe we live in the age of anger. It's unclear, right? Some, you get sociologists to say, yes, we live in the age of anger. People are much more angry than they were before. It, uh, it isn't actually very clear that that's the case. Uh, but whether or not we live at a time where people are more angry than before, people are angry. <laughs> and so to some extent, the issue is there, whether it's worse or not than before. And, and certainly anger is much more visible, right? There's much more visible on Facebook, on Twitter, on TV. I don't know you, but my Facebook, half of it is people abusing each other. Uh, and my Twitter feed is pretty much the same, right? So maybe people were angry in the same way before, but they had less opportunity to sort of divulge to the entire planet how angry they are. Um, one of the reasons why we are so angry is that we are effectively polarized. This is something for which there is quite good evidence, especially in the United States. And uh, there is evidence that this is happening in Britain too. So effective polarization happens when you just become identified with a group and you dislike people who are not a member of your group. Right? So it becomes your group, which could be a political party, could be a football team, could be a gender, could be a race. Right? Your group becomes your identity, becomes something you want to defend, you are invested with, and you just dislike people that belong to the other team. And, uh, and when people are effectively polarized, they might not actually disagree that much about issues. So there is this, m this idea that in the States, for instance, that people are meant to be really issue polarized so that the Democrats are going to the left and the Republicans are going to the right. There is actually very little evidence that people's views are becoming more extreme. It's people dislike of each other that is becoming more extreme. Even if there, is very, there isn't that much of disagreement, people do not like members of the other group, whether or not they agree with them. And there's been a recent report by uh, a public policy center, King's College London, that shows that actually this is happening in Britain. When it comes to issues, taxes, the NHS, and so on. Their report shows that we are becoming fragmented rather than polarized. So people are holding very different views from each other, but there isn't anymore just a Labour supporter and a Conservative supporter. Britain, point, the point of view of people is becoming fragmented, but we are becoming effectively polarized over the Leave and Remain campaign. Leavers dislike, whether or not they agree with them on the NHS, dislike Remainers and vice versa, right? And so it is this sense of dislike for each other that seems to be an engine of anger. And a debate of which, with which I'm familiar, which is so toxic, you have no idea if you're not part of it, is the debate within feminism about the Gender Recognition Act, where uh, feminists of different groups basically are abused, abuse each other, right? Um, and again, sometimes when you have a discussion with people, there are genuine differences about issues, but the issue seems to be more an intense dislike of people on the other side. 
And so in this context, it is tempted to say what we need to do is to become more civil, right? We need to listen to each other, and on that I actually agree, but we need to tone down the heat and be more civil. And so the temptation is to say what we want is people compromise, be civil. And I want to say that actually calls for civility. You know, and well, I say unmitigated, you know, in every contest. I, I am not denying that there are contests where, you know, when people are actually threatening violence, of course. Uh, but generic calls for civility, I think, are not helpful. And one of the reasons why I think they are not helpful is that I think there is value in anger. So let me say why uh, calls for civility are not helpful, apart from the fact, you know, they paper off, they will cover the snakes with wallpaper, right? But apart from that, one of the things that calls for civility do does is, is a form of social control, right? It is a way of, if you call for civility, you're basically telling the other person that they're being rude and uncivil, right? That's what you're saying. You're saying, if you're saying, let's be civil here, what you're saying is, you're not civil, right? It's a way of trying to make people behave differently from how they are by saying they are not being civil. One of the first things to consider is that actually it's very hard, I think, to define civility, apart from saying it's not being rude and so on and so forth, in a way that is, not, is neutral, right? In the same way in which if a man and a woman behave in exactly the same way, sometimes he is assertive and she is aggressive. If, uh, if a person behaves in a certain way, and another person from a different social background behaves in ways that are perhaps similar, you know, he is principled, but, you know, uh, committed, she is like hysterical, right? Or um, why is it that that chilly kind of looking down on people, but sort of cold anger is sort of acceptable, right? But somebody screaming, is not, right? So our criteria, what counts as civil and what counts un as uncivil, is very coded using stereotypes, right? And so some of the behaviors which are rude but are associated with a sort of uh, well-off person from a certain social economic background is thought as, you know, acceptable. But certain other kinds of behavior often coded with people from a lower economic background are called as uncivil, right? And so there is a problem just with the very notion of civility. We all agree uh, to be civil is to be polite, to be respectful, and so on and so forth. But that's not the issue. The issue is which kinds of behavior right, can count as polite. You know, what counts as rude. And our definition of what counts as rude is often colored by class prejudice, for instance. And so, so there is a risk with calls for civility that we are actually targeting people who are subordinated or not in a dominant position anyway, and tell them that they should tone it down, right? But if it, True that people are often, although sometimes they are mistaken, but often people are angry because something bad has happened to them, right? They're angry because they think somebody has done them wrong, right? So if you are powerless and you are angry because somebody has done you wrong, and some so-and-so tells you, you know, calm it down, let's have a civil discussion, and you're powerless. So it's not like you got tons of money that you could uh, organize a campaign or take them to court or, you know, you're angry. It's the only way you've got to call them to books, right? Because you don't have the money, you don't have the means to do something about it. To be told, 
tone it down, right? It means that the only way you have, because you have no other means, to call other people responsible is denied to you, right? And so, remarkably, the first, one of the first people who say this is John Stuart Mill on liberty, who says, right, who says that calls for civility are a form of social control and do the most mischief when they are applied against people who are otherwise powerless. And I take it that what Mill said in mind is precisely that they have no other recourse. Finally, so I've tried to convince you that calls for civility sometimes, perhaps even often, uh, are not morally appropriate. I now want to also say they are often ineffective because there is nothing more irksome to be, than to be told to be civil, right? It, one makes you want to punch them in the face, right? <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, apart from anything else, independently of all the moral argument, it probably doesn't work, okay? And so, calls for civility are not the answer. That side, there are still <coughs> limits. So, no, some angry speech is actually incitement to violence. Some angry speech is actually hate speech, right? And in those cases, although I still would not recommend as the best solution going to that person and say, tone it down because I don't think it will work. Nevertheless, in those cases, what we want is to change their behavior, right? Although the best way to achieve that might not be through calling them uncivil and asking them to become civil. There might be other ways in which we can achieve this. Well, one of the things with incitement to <coughs> violence is, of course, the law. Right, so what I suggest then is that in order to understand better what to do with angry speech, when should we allow it, how, as individuals, should we relate to it, um, I think one of the things we should do in order to make progress on this is try to understand what is anger, right? What is this emotion? And being a philosopher, I start from Aristotle. That's a, this, this a bit of a joke. But so Aristotle writes in the rhetoric about anger. And, and he says the following. Um, so obviously anger is, is an emotion, right? So he says, anger is a desire for retaliation. So it's a desire for retaliation accompanied by distress. And this retaliation because of an apparent slight that was directed without justification against oneself or those who one holds dear. So the, the thought is something like this. Um, you stamp on my foot and you smirk, so I know you didn't fall. I know you didn't pose. You stamped on my foot. I get angry in response, right? And my anger is because what you did was without justification and was a slight directed against me, right? And, and depending how vengeful I am, I get angry and I might then stamp on your foot. Or, if I'm, I might still be angry but less vengeful, I might just say, what made you do that, right? And ask you to apologize or try to find a way to make you be the kind of person who doesn't stamp on people's feet just out of fun, right? And so, if you think about it, that emotion is something complicated, but it's a negative emotion that is in response to a slight. And I say a slight rather than a wrong. Some people say uh, anger is a response to a wrong. Because you can get angry when somebody does something to you, even if you haven't a right to expect their help. So I'll give you an example. 
and I egged the pudding a bit for, for laughter, so I hope I'll get some. So, suppose you are a university student and you're sitting in an exam. And, you know, you're like a bit, you know. So you arrive five min just five minutes before the exam takes place. You're like half asleep and, you know. Next to you, there is this student who is obsessed. And so they sit down, they take out their 10 pens, they line them up. And then you start writing your exam, and halfway through, your pen runs out of ink. And because you are what you are, you haven't got any other way of writing. So you start doing the little eye of the person with 10 pens, right? And they see you doing the little eye. You know, you're doing that little pleading eye. And, and they just pretend you're not doing anything, keep writing, because, you know, there is a reason why they got 10 pence, right? Um, now, you probably get angry, right? But you have no right to any of their pens, right? It's not like you have a right to other, to other people's pens. They have not wronged you, right? But they've been insensitive because they got 10. You got none. And you clearly need one, right? And so that, and that's why you get angry, right? So they've slighted you in a sense, but it's not that they've not wronged you in any way, but they've shown lack of due concerns for your interests. And so that's what I mean by anger being a negative emotion in response to a perceived slight. It's when other people are callous or insensitive or actually wrong you. And you respond with anger. And this anger response includes fe feelings of heat, right? When you're angry, you can feel it inside you, right? And, and sometimes feelings of aggression, but not always, right? Parents get angry with their children, and sometimes because they're angry with their children, they smack them. <coughs> but sometimes, so in that case, you get the feeling of aggression. But sometimes parents get angry with their children, but don't want to smack them, right? don't want to aggress them, they just want to help them see their, that they should behave differently, right? So anger is not always associated with aggression. Uh, it's associated with a sort of realization that something, you know, a slight has been, something wrong has been done to you, or I say to somebody, you old dear, because if somebody hurts my sister, I get angry, right? Uh, and importantly with anger, there is a tendency to, to want the other person to do something. And the, the do something is, right, uh, get amends, acknowledge they've done something wrong, apologize. But sometimes anger is also accompanied by desire to get even. And that's what Aristotle was focusing on. And that's what also Martha Nussbaum focuses on. And that's why she thinks that anger is always counterproductive. So Nussbaum, with the exception of transitional anger, which I will not go in, but Nussbaum's uh, argument why anger is always counterproductive, uh, I hope I'm not caricaturing it, is that anger is always accompanied by, an, by a desire for revenge, and revenge is almost always counterproductive. So the argument is if somebody kills your brother, and you kill their brother, neither brother come, comes back to life, right? And so if you're angry because somebody killed your brother and you kill their brother, you don't get what you want because what you want is your brother being alive, right? And so for Newsbaum, since anger always includes a desire for revenge, anger is almost always irrational. I disagree because I think uh, the anger of a parent toward the child is not associated with revenge. The anger of a friend toward another friend might be associated with revenge, but it might not, right? So anger is not always a desire for revenge, but it's always a form of moral address, I hope to convince you. It's always, it always involves a tendency to ask the other person to do something in response 
Right, so another thing that I like to say about anger, so, so far I've told you is an emotion, is negative, makes a demand upon the other person to apologize or make a man change. Um, sometimes it's linked to aggression and desire for revenge. The other thing that I want to say is anger, like other emotions, is not a mere feeling. It's a way of evaluating a situation. So one way you can sort of say is when you're angry, you are perceiving, if you want, the situation as one that is deserving or fitting an angry response. So let me give you an example with another emotion where I think it's easier to see the point. So think of fear, right? So you are walking in the woods and the snake appears and you are afraid. Your fear is an evaluation of the situation as scary or deserving of a fear response, right? Fear is not a just a feeling, but is an assessment of the situation as fearsome or deserving to be responded in a fearful manner. The same happens with anger. Anger is a way of assessing a situation as angersome, i.e. fitting or being answered in, a, in an angry way. And the situation is angersome when a wrong or a slight has occurred. And so, say, I don't know. I'll give you a controversial example so that you'll crucify me in the Q&A. <laughs> um, so when I first came to the, well, when I first came to the UK many, many years ago, because I'm ancient, um, after a while, I sort of, you know, changed, I think, through sort of going to university and so on and so forth. And men opening the door for me started annoying me, really annoying me. Um, but I didn't know why, right? But that was an example, so I could sort of f find an angry response, right, without knowing why I was angry. But clearly, you know, rightly or wrongly, you know, I was starting to perceive that situation as angersome, and that's why I was being angry, right? Before, when I was in Italy, I didn't perceive it as anger. So, um, so either I, my anger now has been trained so that I actually am more accurate uh, and I perceive situations that are genuinely angersome, as angersome was when I was in Italy, I was blind, uh, or Britain has made me overly sensitive. <laughs> and so I was you know, correct before, and now I have this false positive. I, I leave you to have your preferred interpretation of the situation, but it gives you a sense of what I mean, right? You, you sort of, when you respond angrily, you, you respond angrily to a situation, which is a way of perceiving the situation as having a certain significance or relevance, uh, of having a certain moral significance in this case. Right. Uh, and as I say, the reason why it has a moral significance. So you, you perceive the situation as one where somebody intentionally has been, has slighted you by not showing due regard. Now, in philosophy we say that if the situation is genuinely angersome, i.e. you really have been slighted, something wrong has really happened, right? Then your perception of the situation as anger, so I, your anger is fitting, right? To say that your anger is fitting is to say there is a correct evaluation of the situation. Um, but in order to be correct, anger also needs to be proportional, right? So the angry response needs to be proportional to the nature of the slight. So, you know, so again, I mean, if I give you the example with fear, right, if you, if you are afraid of a poisonous snake, your fear is fitting. 
if you are afraid of a piece of string, everything else being equal, your fear is probably not fitting, right? There could be dangerous pieces of string. I mean, you know, you can. Saying that anger is fitting is not to say that it's justified. And again, you can think of the parent-child example. So, it, it, you know, the, the child might, might be doing something, you know, really stupid that really deserves an angry response. But for whatever reason, the parent might decide that in that case it would be counterproductive. So even if an angry response would be fitting, the parent might try not to feel anger because he or she thinks that everything being taken into account, it would be counterproductive. And so fitting anger might not be justified, right? But anger that is not fitting, I th think, although people disagree on this, is never justified. Some people say that even if it's not fitting, it could be justified, but I think not. Right, so status anger. I, I think I've given you a good sense of what anger is, so I'm now <coughs> going to, I hope I have at least, I'm going to start uh, speeding up a little bit because I don't want to talk for too long. So I think status anger is a particular specific kind of anger. So it's anger, right? But it's anger where the slight is about social status. So let me give you a good example of status anger and a bad example of status anger. So what I think a good example of status anger that is fitting is, again, I sort of look at my own personal life. Um, when I started at university, I was only two or three years young, uh, older than my students. Um, and it was quite a while ago. Um, and so all my colleagues were called doc. Now we all call each other by name. Uh, but at the time, there were some formalities. Uh, so all my colleagues were called doctor or mister, so and so, right? If they didn't have a PhD, but mostly doctors. Was that they called me Alessandra, the students. Maybe I was encouraging that. Maybe it was my fault, right? Um, but they. You know, sometimes I find that, like, annoying, right? And so I would say, no, no, you know, I'm not the secretary. And, you know, my name is Dr. Tanizini. That was an example of status anger, right? I was, an, I was responding with anger to behavior that I felt was diminishing on my social status. And because I felt it was diminishing on my social status, was perceived as a slight, right? Um, but there are other cases of, you know, uh, of status anger that perhaps are not fitting, right? When there are some people who think that they are so important they should be treated differently from other people, right? So that if you treat them like a normal human being, they just think that behavior is not fitting of them, right? So that could be another example of, of status anger, right? In general, status anger is anger about hierarchies and feeling that your place in the hierarchy is not being respected. And you might be right, right? Or you might be wrong. And in generally, status anger is a defensive response. 10 minutes, so I really better speed up here. Right. And what I want to say is that often status anger actually does involve the desire to get even, right? And that makes sense, because if status anger is about feeling that you are in a certain place in a social hierarchy and you're being taken down, by taking revenge, which need not be like violence, but by pushing the person who pushed you down, down, by push, so you are here and they are here. They push you down by disrespecting you, so they are above you. You disrespect them and you, repress, you, replay, re, repre, you get the situation back as it was, right? And so status anger, when, when it expresses itself with the desire to push other people down, can actually be effective. Whether it's justified or not is another question. Right, so I want to say in here, I'll be very quick and I'll ask you to ask me questions, that um, often, although not always, uh, arrogant people 
suffer from status anger. The, the thought is that arrogance is about the need to feel superior. Um, and it can be either you as an individual need to feel superior or you are used to belong to a group that thought of itself as being superior. Um, either way, if you're being brought down a peg, you feel that you're being disrespected, and so you feel that you've been slighted. And so, insofar as arrogant people need to feel superior, being, they arrogate special entitlements for themselves, the entitlements that go with their superior status. But if people treat them norm, as normal human beings, then they feel they're being diminished. Now, this perhaps is controversial, but uh, I think that even if we do not endorse it ourselves, certain norms of superiority are embodied in some of our group identities. So most of us, not all of us here, are white. Uh, and I think one of the features of whiteness, even if we dislike it, even if we do not endorse it, is that we are the result of a culture that thinks that white is superior. After all, the superiority of the white race was used a, as a justification for colonialization. And so there are norms of superiorities that, of superiority that are there in some of our group identities, even if, as I say, we perhaps don't want to endorse them ourselves. And the moment that we are treated in ways that we are not, we are not used to being treated, then we feel we are being disrespected. Even if we do not realize that that expectation to be treated that way, that comes out of their habit that that's how they normally treat people as, is an illegitimate expectation. You see what I mean? It's not like you are consciously a racist. But you're just the kind of person who is not used to have the door of a shop closed in your face because they think you might be a shopkeeper. Uh, not keeper, shoplifter, right? The moment they close the door in your face, you think, because perhaps, uh, I don't know, your clothes are not that nice anymore because you lost your job, um, right? Then at that point, you think you've been done a great slight, right? Um, and so the thought, in that case, you actually have been done a great slight. But um, there are plenty of examples of things that white people are not used to, right? Um, because, and, and the moment it's done to you, you just think, this is a great disrespect, right? Uh, but it just comes to the, out of the fact sometimes that we as white people are not used to being treated that way, right? And so what I'm saying is not that necessarily that all white people are arrogant. I mean, although most people are arrogant a little bit in some way. Uh, but that these defensive responses that are characteristic of arrogance can come out, right, if you belong to a group that, where you expect special treatment, even if you're not aware that that's what you do. Right? And so this kind of anger that we have sometimes, sometimes is a displacement for other slides, uh, is an attempt to self-enhance, to regain that status to which we were used to, which perhaps we didn't realize, but was an expectation of privilege. Right, so I think that this kind of anger causes um, Behaviors that are designed to take people down a peg so that you can feel superior again. And I think the classic examples are intimidation and humiliation. And because I'm running out of time, I'll be very quick. But I don't, you don't need me to tell you that, you know, there are many cases where people intimidate other people by speaking over them, shouting them down, doing this, right? Or that role, right? That sort of, you know, shaking of the head. And here she goes again. Right? Um, all of these behaviors, they are designed to 
intimidate and humiliate other people, uh, what they are aimed to do is to elevate oneself by take, bringing other people down. I have to be very quick. So I will leave this for you. There's a whole tradition, especially in the States, but elsewhere, that says anger is really good. So, so far I've told you anger is bad. You know, it's used by people, by putting other people down, intimidating, humiliating them. It's a symbol of people who either consciously or unconsciously think they are superior, better than everybody else, right? So anger is bad, right? And then you get this stuff and you think, no, no, hold on a second. There's a whole tradition that says, unless you get angry, you do not respect yourself, right? That anger is required by self-respect. If you belong to a group of people who is being pushed down and pushed down and pushed down, if you do not respond in anger, you're not respecting yourself, right? Uh, Audrey Lord says to a white feminist, is it really the tone of my voice that is a problem here? Or the fact that if you listen carefully, your life has to change? Um, James Baldwin says, you know, there is no black, well, he used the M word, uh, there is no black <coughs> person alive that doesn't feel this rage, right? And you, you can't stop feeling that rage because the moment you stop feeling that rage, you stop respecting yourself. So there is a whole other tradition where rage and anger is fundamental, right? Black lives matter, right? Which doesn't mean only black lives matter, right? Black lives matter means those lives matter too, right? And they also talk about the importance of anger in the fight for equality as an essential component of self-respect, right? As a response to a slight, gosh, how many slights? The small ones, the big ones, every day. And sometimes this anger too is status anger. Sometimes it's concerned with not being given the respect that is appropriate for people of, of that status, right? And sometimes it might also involve a disposition to get even. So it might have some of all the bad features of the arrogant anger. So it might be very hard to tell them apart, right? But why is this anger sometimes good? Why is this anger sometimes so useful? Because if you, don't, if you are not angry, when in the face of relentless oppression, you give up. Anger keeps you going. It might damage your well-being, right? There is plenty of scientific evidence that shows that people who are angry all the time leave shorter lives, become sicker. So it's, Lisa Tessman has called anger a burdened virtue of the oppressed. It is a virtue of the oppressed because it's instrumental in the fight against oppression but it's burdened because it damages physically, mentally, the well-being of the people who have it. Uh, but also, anger, like other emotions, is contagious. Have you ever been in a room where you sensed fear and you became afraid? Uh, that is emotional contagion. Anger is like that. And so, not only does anger motivate individuals to act, but it also spreads to other people and so motivates them to act and it creates communities. Uh, anger is valuable because it produces knowledge. I'll be quick on this because I've already told you how it does so. It is an alarm bell. It alerts you that something is off, even if you don't have the words for it. But a word of caution here. Uh, anger, like other defense mechanisms, has evolved with the tendency to give you false positives. And so we tend to be angry when the situation doesn't deserve it sometimes. Uh, there, is there is empirical evidence done on graduate students 
uh, in universities, that people tend to be angry at situations that don't deserve it. So the anger would be unreliable because it would give a lot of false positives. There is no studies and no evidence whatsoever on whether anger can be trained so that activists, people who are politically engaged, are less subject to these mistakes. I suspect anger can be trained, and I suspect they will be more reliable, but no one knows. And I'm just going to say that, uh, uh, this bit, because I know otherwise I'm going on for too long. Uh, I think, so I've told you why anger is valuable as motivation. I've told you that anger can teach you stuff. I now want to say that anger is a form of moral address. So there is a tendency, and I think it is a real mistake, to think that if somebody is angry, right? Their expression of anger, which you can read in their face, in their voice, is an expression of a mental state. So there's a mistake, I think, in saying that when you see somebody is angry, to think that what they are communicating to you is how they feel. When people are angry, they are not primarily communicating to you how they feel. They are communicating to you how they see the situation. Right? They're communicating that that situation is one that is angersome. They communicate an evaluation of a situation that locates you as the person, insofar as you are the target of the angry response, as opposed to a witness, that you are the person who has done something wrong or has done a slight. They are communicating to you how they see the situation. They are communicating that they think something has gone wrong and that you are responsible for it, if you are the target of the anger. And they are making a demand upon you. They're asking you to do something. Apologize, make amends. Right. And so by being angry, they're not telling you, this is how I'm feeling. They're saying, you better do something. That's what anger does. Tell somebody else, you better do something. It's not saying, oh, I feel angry. It's saying, you did wrong. And, and also, it's not just saying, you did wrong, you must change. But you must change because I'm asking it of you, because I am angry. So anger is a form of moral address that demand is a way of holding people accountable, but it's also a way of saying, you're accountable to me. You should change not just because morality demands it of you, you should change because I demand it of you. So, when people say to women, don't be hysterical, they are silencing their anger. What they are doing, and it's not just women, I mean, it's a cheap shot. Um, what they are doing is pretending that anger is just an expression of a mental state when anger <coughs> is a way of holding people responsible. By saying, oh, you're just venting, right? By saying that, what is a communicative act, i.e. an attempt to hold people responsible, is being read as a mere emoting, as a mere, at best, expression of a mental state. And so it is as if I attempted to give you an order and you said, oh, she made some noise. Right? Anger is like that. Is a directive. It's like an order. It says, do something. And if somebody who has the right to give you an order says, do something, and say, oh, what was that? Right? That's offensive. So that's what silencing of anger does. But of course, if anger is often silenced, then people suppress it. Because there is nothing more depressing than being angry and being treated as a madwoman. And so people then start self-suppressing. 
And if what I've said before is right, these silencing and suppressing of anger have terrible consequences. The, the silencing of anger deprives people of the ability to hold other people to account. It's an important form, essential form of moral agency. Well, it is to be a moral agent, is to, one of the things, uh, is to be a member of a community that is recognized as somebody who is able to hold other people to account. That's what it is to be an equal you know, person with equal dignity to everybody else. You're able to hold other people to account. If you are continuously silenced, that is one of the ways in which your ability to hold other people to, into account is zapped out. If you continuously silence yourself, suppress your own anger, insofar as anger is an important source of knowledge of when you have been wronged, is an alarm bell, right? If you learn not to feel angry, you lose the alarm bell. It's like somebody losing the ability to feel pain, you burn yourself on the stove. If you lose the ability to feel angry, you lose the ability to tell what something is off. And of course, it's a matter of degree. I mean, I'm not saying that by being silenced, people completely lose their ability to get angry. It's just that that fine tuning goes away. So now for the damp squid. Is it squib or squid? I just call that. I discovered, after 20 years I lived in the UK, I discovered that I was saying the wrong thing. It's quib, isn't it? Yes. Because I always thought, yeah, squid is damp, so well, it's <laughs> damp squid. Right, um, so what is the solution? I do not know. Uh, I know that the solution is respecting anger uh, in part, but without letting it go off board. So the solution is a bit of a disappointment, but uh, the real solution would be the end of injustice. Um, but if some of the uh, empirical work on this is correct, part of the problem with status anger when it's arrogant is there is a defensive mechanism. Um, and so psychologists are experimenting with something that is called self-affirmation, which is shown to have some useful results. Uh, Self-affirmation is not getting up every morning, looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, aren't I great? It's not that. Uh, Self-affirmation is, is ref reflection on value. So the thought here is to practice reflecting on what, you, what is of value to you and why you value it. And one of the reasons why is that is meant to make you less uh, defensive is the mechanisms are not known. This is just one of the several hypotheses. Is that it expands the self. So when you affirm values, you see that there is more to you than being a remainer. Right? There are all these other things that you value. And so if somebody attacks your remainer bit, there is this other stuff that is still safe. And so the idea is that if you reflect consistently, and especially before you enter a conversation with a person that you envisage will have a view that is different from yours, uh, trying for everybody to affirm what they value, it helps you become less defensive. If you are a person that is gener generally stereotyped, and, and so might be on the other hand, anxious in the debate. Uh, this value affirmation techniques have been shown to bolster self-esteem and reduce stereotype threat. And so they're both helpful for people who come to the debate feeling superior and to the people who come to the deb debate feeling inferior. In both cases, uh, value affirmation should make you less fearful for your own identity or the fragility of your own identity, and therefore more able um, not to be less angry, but to have your anger being more fitting, and if you are on the receiving end of anger, to be more capable of responding to anger in a non-angry way. 
And on that, I'll thank you.